Hi, I'm Russ Long and welcome to our demonstration on HA. Now what we're going to be doing here is we're going to actually go through the configuration step by step of high availability. Now as you can see we are in my environment and we're looking at our lab infrastructure. Um, so this is our data center and here is our cluster. If you remember we already uh, configured DRS for one of these clusters. DRS is configured for this cluster as well. Now that is not a bad thing necessarily for this particular implementation. DRS and HA can work well together, so we're going to go ahead and implement these together at the same time so I can show you another implementation or feature that we can use. So the first things first, uh, we have a cluster created, but if I was going to create a cluster, all we would have to do is right click on a data center and go with new cluster, and then you could turn on HA from there. You could even go through your options and uh, configure the entire setup from the cluster creation. But I don't want to do that. Let's go through the edit process because that's a little different. Um, let's, uh, I'll go to getting started and I'll show you how to do that. You can right click and go to settings. This will bring you to configure and then services. Now you can see we're starting off at DRS and we already have DRS configured pretty well. So I'm going to skip that. We'll go to vSphere availability. Now in documentation, and as I've described it, we've called it high availability. Here under the settings, it's just vSphere availability. So be aware of that. We're gonna go ahead and click on edit. And as you can see, this brings us right to our cluster settings. The first setting is to turn vSphere HA on. Now I've worked with many admins in the past and I've already told you this, but they think it's a set it and forget it feature. It really isn't. If you want control, you have to understand the detailed aspects of what's going to happen when you click that box. So make sure you understand that just clicking the box isn't going to protect your environment all by itself. So uh, another feature we have below that is proactive HA. Now proactive HA works hand in hand with DRS. And what it does is it monitors the services health services health, the service health of each component in your host. If it figures that RAM, uh, uh, CPU, or some other aspect is failing, it's going to proactively take steps to migrate virtual machines off a host. We call this proactive HA. Now I'm going to go ahead and leave this turned on for both so we can go down the list of some of our options. First off is failure, failures and responses. We have host failures, which is the, the normal option for HA. This is just going to monitor hosts themselves. If anything happens to the hosts, we're going to restart all those virtual machines on another host in the cluster. We can do, uh, uh, we can, we can determine our failure response, what we want to do if there is a host failure. We can turn this off if host monitoring is turned off and we're monitoring at a virtual machine level. But for our case, we're going to leave it on and uh, we're going to restart VMs if there's any problems with the host. We have a VM restart priority. So what priority do these virtual machines have on the new host? Is it medium, low, high, or highest? We can also allocate for powered on, guest heartbeat selected. We have an additional delay we can build in. And then dependency restarts. We can put a delay in for that or a timeout for that. We also have our host isolation response. Remember when I said you can be disconnected from the rest of your cluster? You could not be receiving uh, HA agent communication from other slaves or masters in your environment. Well, when that happens, you can define a response in your environment. So I could shut down the VMs that are on that isolated host and restart those VMs on other hosts in the cluster. Now, somebody, lots of people ask me shut down versus power off difference. Think of pulling the plug versus actually going through your guest operating system and going to shut down in that manner. So one's graceful and one's just pulling power. Uh, we have data store paths with uh, path down and all path down. So permanent device loss versus all paths down. All paths down, uh, this is our data store connectivity and uh, Permanent device losses, again, is our data store connectivity. So we can choose which one of these we want to use in response to losing a data store. 
We also have our response recovery. We can reset VMs or leave it disabled with a response delay. Now, if you're not going to do host monitoring, if you want to monitor at a much, much tighter level, VM monitoring, this requires a HA agent to be installed directly onto the guest itself. So we're going to have a little bit closer monitoring and it's going to add a little overhead to the virtual machine instead of installing on the host it's on the virtual machine in this case so when we turn this on if we turn on vm monitoring or application monitoring remember we're adding resources to our virtual machine that we may not have taken into account before it's a very small amount but we have to have vm tools installed to make that work Next up, we have our proactive HA failures and responses, so we can get very detailed in what we're going to do. We can even quarantine different things during our remediation. Um, this is really outside the scope of our course, but I wanted to show it to you because it's a newer feature of 6.5. This allows us to move virtual machines before things happen. It's a really cool feature. I would recommend you use this in your lab and see how you like it, see how it responds. Uh, next, we have admission control. Now, this is all about our failover options. How much failover are we planning for? In this case, you can see in our, my cluster, I'm planning for a maximum of one host failure. And that makes a lot of sense because in this lab environment, I only have two hosts here. So if either one of them fails, I want some type of redundancy built in. And we can do this based on a cluster resource percentage, a slot policy. So I could create a slot define a CPU size and memory size. So if I go with a fixed slot size, I can I say, oh, let's calculate what VMs require. Requiring multiple slots, zero out of six. And our slot size is 32 megahertz and 100 megabytes. So there's not a lot of virtual machines that require more than that, those resources per slot. And then what would we would do is figure out how many slots each host can handle, and then that defines how many virtual machines can fail over. Percentage-wise is much easier. I take, I take the total number of, uh, of percentage that's available, and then we can calculate what's the failover. So if I have virtual machines that use up to 50% on one host, and my hosts are built exactly the same, I would need a 50% failover capacity. Okay. Now the problem with this comes if I have a, a virtual machine that utilizes more than the 50%. So if I had three virtual uh, three hosts and each host utilized 66% of the total allocation of resources on each host, that means I roughly have enough failover if I calculate 33% for CPU and RAM, right? As long as I'm utilizing 66% on each host, and each host is built similarly, if a host fails, I can see a rise on the other two hosts of 33%. That makes sense. We divide 66 by two, we get 33. But that 66% may not be equally distributed among the virtual machines. So I may have a virtual machine that's running at 40%, let's say, and the rest of the virtual machines on that host run at 23% for a total of 63%. But if that host fails, I only have 33% in reserve in my other two hosts. So that 40% virtual machine has nowhere to go. It will go to one of those hosts, it just won't be able to power on because there's insufficient resources to do so. So we'll leave it at percentage, we'll leave it at 33. That's not enough in my environment. I should get a warning about that, by the way. And then we can automatically select the data stores and then go to advanced options. Now, I don't have enough shared uh, data stores in this environment for this to work. So we're supposed to see an error when I click OK here. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for an error. It'll say response. This should turn green when we're all done. But we're looking to see an error because we don't have enough data stores. As long as we see the, uh, the error, we're good. And let me bring back in, um, we're gonna bring back in our recent tasks so we can see what's going on. Work in progress, all that goodies, all the goodies. So we're expecting an error here. If we, we, we see the error, we're done with the demonstration. I showed you everything you needed to know. Um, if we don't see an error, we need to look into why we're not receiving an error. I made sure we would get an error in this one because I wanted to show 
the data store issue. Uh-oh, it's taking a little longer than we like. Let's refresh one more time. So why are we gonna receive this error? We're going to receive this error because if you remember correctly from our slides, data store heart beating is used in host monitoring. And when host monitoring is in place, we are running a data store heartbeat as well. We are not only having a master and slave communication through the HA management that gives us an idea that the other hosts are up, but we also communicate through the data store in case that other heartbeat goes down. It's like confirmation that the host is really down when it says it's down. So we need those hosts to have access to the data stores in order for this to work. If we don't have this access, then we have an issue because we, don't, we no longer have that second confirmation. If there's any loss in the HA management communication, all of a sudden we're gonna think it's down. We don't want that. We want two confirmations that the host is actually down before we have any response. That's not up at the moment. Okay. All right, so here's my environment. Let's see, the infrastructure is yellow. Good, that's actually what we're looking for. Let's see, insufficient configure to satisfy desired VGA. Oh, okay, so we don't have enough failover. Uh, let's go ahead and configure that. Uh, uh, yeah, obviously, because I put 33%, we need more than that in order to have failover because certain things are in there. So we need to go to admission control we're going to go back to slot slot capacity and fix slot size calculate good good click OK and let that reconfigure now the data store heartbeat should not be working uh, let's wait until this uh, configuration is over we'll refresh where the cluster seems there oh, okay here we go yes okay there's our warning Phew. Our warning says the number of HA data stores for this host is zero, which is less than required two. So I have no shared data stores here. Um, remember we need, we start at two by default, we can go up to five. So that's why I left that warning in there. Uh, no, oh, okay. Uh, here's another thing. If you have no management network redundancy and you click suppress warning, this actually does something pretty cool. Watch this. I'm gonna go up here to HA. We're gonna go to edit. By clicking on that, we actually configured an advanced option, DAS ignore redundant net warning. This actually took that redundant warning and turned it off for us, okay? So we're not gonna see that particular warning again, but we do have the data store warning. I like this warning up for those of you out there because this tells me I have no heartbeat redundancy if anything happens to my management network and I'm not allowed to communicate there, I'm automatically gonna assume that the other host is down and I'm gonna do my restart policy, which might not be the case. I might be just isolated. Then I would have two virtual machines running at the same time. Not good at all. You have to make sure you have this redundancy built in. So this was a do as I show, I mean, do as I say, not as I do situation. And our last little lesson here in, in the live portion is to find out what your slave and master is. If you take a look, you just go to the vSphere HA state and you can see connected slave. If I go up here to 202, you will see connected master. There it is, running master. All right, remember those roles, remember what they do, remember how communication takes place over HA agents on each of the hosts. Remember that all of this transfers over the management network. Uh, there's lots of cool things about HA. We just 
touch the tip of the iceberg here. We didn't really go down into de deep details. I'm gonna leave that for the more advanced classes or when you take a really advanced class to look into it. Or maybe for you to figure out on your own. Sometimes that's the best way to learn uh, once you get the basics down is to just dive in uh, head first.